The morning sun shines on the gleaming hide of a muscular ranch horse. The aroma of bacon and coffee drifts from the wood cook stove at a cow camp. Silver spurs jingle as the men and women of the West get set for another day in the saddle. From the heart of Canada's finest ranching country, this is the Spirit of the West with rancher and horse trainer Hugh McLennan and his collection of music, poetry, and conversations with the folks who live and work with horses and cattle in the Spirit of the West. If you were listening to this program back in March of 2007, you'd have heard my good friend, the roping psychologist, Dr. Michael Johnson, with the incredible story called Healing Shine. Shine, a big rope horse prospect that took seven years out of Michael's life, cost him friends and family members, and the story wound up in an absolutely spellbinding book, an audio book. Well, we've kept in touch since then, and Michael called the other day to say he'd written and recorded a brand new book called The Trials of Joe Ben Black, Confessions of a Rope Horse. And in the coming weeks, we're going to let you hear some of the heartwarming stories from his latest work. And then I'll be talking to him from his ranch in Texas. But this week, one of the many episodes from the new book, besides being a top roper on his high school rodeo team, Michael rode saddle broncs. And that's what you're going to hear about today. And the big horse bucked down the arena. I never felt like so much of a cowboy in my life. In perfect time with a good bronc. Now today's show will take on kind of a bronc riding focus. Even Baxter Black will help keep us on track. So, did you hear about Orban getting backed off? Must have sailed five coyote lengths, hit the side of the grain bin with a moose bugle, and two cowfuls of pellets fell on him. On the Rangeland News, the latest cattle on feed numbers have just been released. We'll also give us indication of the number of heifers which are being held for beef and dairy herd replacement. As always, something special in this week's Cowboy Poetry Spotlight. He never wrote before, so I showed him how, and it didn't take long to catch his first cow. On the horse training file, a horse that gets pretty spooky when he hasn't been ridden all winter, and I'll suggest a few things that might help his rider feel more confident on those first few rides in the spring. Oh yeah, Ryan Fritz, fine young cowboy, was really well received at the big Elko gathering, and we just got Ryan's brand new CD called Keeper of the West. All personal songs about Ryan's cowboy career. This one was inspired by one of his first full-time riding jobs at the famous Alkali Lake Ranch. Listen for some familiar, well-known names in the cowboy world of the North. Well, a long time ago, when I left my prairie home, headed for a cowboy job at Alkali. Ah, oh, damn it, how I loved the West and loved the rope and ride. I was heading for a job in the line. My 1972 Chevy truck was through and it died on the side of the road. So with my saddle and my dog, I thumbed down a load of logs. I was back on track again for the line. The first one I met, I think, was Joe Rosette Had a brand in dragging calves to the fire And I thought, what the heck, these guys who drag them by the neck But that's how it was done at El Goliath There was that grave of Francesca Sierra They say that he laid with silver spurs each time we rode by, look each other in the eye and just smile, riding that alkali. He's moved on The horses I rode there have died But my young dreams fulfilled Now stored in my mind I'm riding that elk alive I still see that grave of Francesca Sierra They say that he lays with silver spurs And each time we rode by Look each other in the eye and just smile 
Isn't that great? And I'm so happy to uh, see that uh, Ryan Fritz will be at the Kamloops Cowboy Festival in March. Okay, well, Dr. Michael Johnson's brand new book is a page turner, and there's a very important principle that he illustrates with a vivid memory from his high school days. At the age of 17, I had entered the university. I rode saddle broncs and roped on the rodeo team in college. And while my roping skills were average... My bronc riding skills were far less than average. Yet, I rarely garnered any points for our team in roping and almost always scored points by placing in the saddle bronc competition. I don't score points at what I'm fairly good at and do score points at what I'm not good at? Yes. How on earth could that be? Because in those days, people from the South could really rope, but they rarely made the whistle on saddle broncs. If you drew a line across the middle of America from west to east, until the 60s, only five RCA saddle bronc champions ever came from south of that line. Former saddle bronc champs hailed almost exclusively from the north and northwest, and I have a theory to explain that. If you live in the south and you buck off your horse, the worst thing that can happen is your dad and uncles will have a good laugh and rib you unmercifully for two days. If you buck off your horse in the north, you freeze to death. So cowboys in those more dangerous climbs learn to ride broncs really well. At least that's my theory. Of course, none of that's true about bronc riding these days. Everybody is better everywhere. And just for the record, the reason people in the south rope so well was because if you missed a steer at a roping while heading for your dad or uncle's, who of course paid both ends because sons and nephews never have any money, if you missed one when roping with those guys, they killed you. Or at least they did in the 60s. And nowadays, because men in the South have become much kinder, if you miss for modern-day male relatives, they just shoot you in the leg. So you can still rope in the next go-round. Dang, that hurt, Unc. I think I'll have a scar for life. You think that hurt, boy? That was just a little old twenty two caliber. If you miss that next one, you won't have a life. Now, you get that bleeding stopped and get your head in the game. We're up in a minute. But there was one thing I could do in my college rodeo days. I could make the whistle on saddle broncs. Because I had ridden so many young colts on our farm, I could stay on. I looked like a ragged, tied-on Ken doll flopping all over the horse, doing it. But if I didn't lose a pedal, stirrup, I could complete the ride and get a score. Often... An embarrassingly low score, but nonetheless, a score. And since there were very few qualified bronc rides at college rodeos in those days, I sometimes made one of the few allowing me to help our team. And sometimes I won just because I showed up. Coming up, Michael takes us right into the rodeo high school finals and how the entire school wound up counting on him. And a song about a legendary bucking horse from the great Rusty Richards when the Spirit of the West continues right after this. Welcome back to the Spirit of the West. Dr. Michael Johnson's brand new book has a number of life lessons that I think have real value. One of them illustrated in the vivid word pictures this master storyteller paints. The area finals college rodeo was about to begin. The winner would move on to the Southern Regional Finals. During our preliminary team meeting, our coach reminded us we had a chance. Our women are really strong, he began. Strong in both the breakaway roping and the barrels. And we began to file out, and the coach said, Michael, uh, son, we need to talk. Michael, uh, he began, he said, I hate to tell you, but, well, that's no way to talk. David beat Goliath, but he was struggling to get the words out. I said, it's okay, coach, I know, Butch will be there. He seemed not to hear me and continued. He said, the fact is, son, Butch is going to be there. Of course, we all knew he would be, and let the words hang there. I'm supposed to say bear down or something, but but we both know what this means. There's no need to be embarrassed, because I don't think anybody in college rodeo can beat Butch in this event. But there's something you can do, son. What? I asked him. Shoot him? 
No, for God's sakes, I don't want you to shoot him. Not even in the leg? Michael, he said with a look. Get serious with me for a minute here, son. Of course, how we do depends on everyone. But we can let Butch have his first place and still come out on top. No matter who wins first in the individual events, this all comes down to points. You know, like second, third, fourth. We'll get our share. The critical factor is how our team does from top to bottom. If we win a couple of firsts and enough of the lower places, we've got them. That's where you come in. Let Butch have his first. Make sure you place. Don't try to do something you can't do. It's not so important that you beat him. What's important is you stay on that horse till that buzzer sounds. If you get us anything, it might turn the tide in our favor. I don't care how you look. Stay on that horse, son. Get a score. You got that? Can you do that for us, son? I got it, coach, I said. Butch was Butch Cody, the saddle bronc rider from Kansas, and he was one smooth customer. Butch never tried to do something on a bronc he couldn't do. He rode skillfully and under control due to his great rhythm and superb balance. And because of all that, Butch almost always won. Each contestant would ride three horses in the saddle bronc event. Butch was first out, and as expected, rode his horse with smooth and silky perfection. After marking a handsome 80, he did a flying dismount, landing squarely on both feet to the delight of the crowd. Loud applause. I was second. As the coach instructed, I made the whistle. I almost bucked off, only twice during the ride, but I had a score. I was also able to execute my own flying dismount, landing squarely on the side of my face. No one clapped, nor was there any applause when the judge announced my score of 60. The six other competitors all bucked off. Round two was the same song, second verse. Butch was a star, marking 80 again. And I marked 60 again, and everybody else bucked off. And that second 60 of mine ensured our coach had what he wanted, some points for placing. What he hadn't expected was second. Much joy on that second night. The coach approached me. Hey, Miguel, he said. One more, son, one more. You never know. Not that I'm wishing that kid from Kansas any bad luck, you understand. But if he bucks off and you don't, you know what that means, don't you, son? Do you really think there's a chance of that, coach, I asked him? Not a chance in hell, son. <laughs> no way in hell. But you never know. Well, what happened next is uh, really amazing, and we'll get to it after a song from the great Rusty Richards. Rusty wrote this about a legendary bucking horse. Up in central South Dakota, the north bank of the old Mizzou, a yellow mare got down the pole in a manner that most mares do. It wasn't long before her foal could stand a little luck. By sunrise he could gallop, and by sundown he could buck, and they called him Yellow Jacket, Yellow Jacket, Yellow Jacket, Yellow Jacket, Yellow Jacket. The next few years were mighty good out there on the Sutton Ranch. He grazed on the sweet Dakota grass, and he drank from the river's branch. While they gathered him in to the main corrals with the rest of the herd that spring. And though they broke into the saddle, he was mighty hard to straddle and swim to the rough stock spring. Went Yellow Jacket, Yellow Jacket, Yellow Jacket, Yellow Jacket, Yellow Jacket. Jim thought for the saddle brown, he might be a little bit light But he knew all along he was quick and strong For the bears he was just about right While he jerked the rigging from many a hand And many a top hand too And pound for pound he jerked them around So they'd never forget when they drew Yellow jacket, yellow jacket, yellow jacket, yellow jacket, yellow jacket, yellow jacket. I'm not gonna say that there weren't some That the old horse didn't repel But in order to get to the pay window They passed through the gates of hell he was picked for the national finals for the rest of his life, I'm told. And the team of Corco and Sutton spelled South Dakota gold. Yellow jacket, yellow jacket, yellow jacket, yellow jacket, yellow jacket. At age 32, they retired him, still bucking in mighty fine form. And all who knew him admired him, for there never was a tougher horse born. He's gone now to a better place, there's no song left to sing. But the empty stands and some old tough hands will never forget the sting. Yellow jacket, 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 yellow jacket. Rusty Richards, of course, for 20 years as the tenor for the Sons of the Pioneers and the author of a wonderful book on the life of his close friend, the late Casey Tibbs, called Born to Ride. The book was about 20 years in the making, and it's worth every word. 
Well, we left Dr. Michael Johnson there in the arena with one more Bronc to ride and the success of the entire rodeo team resting on his youthful shoulders. My team members set my saddle and pulled the cinch tight. I climbed into the chute and eased down on my bronc. They leaned close and whispered in my ear, Now you try hard, Miguel, you try hard now. And then they stepped away. Extending my left hand high with the buck rein wound tightly in my fingers, I said to the gate men, Here we go, boys, outside. The bronc came and reared just a bit, and my spurs were past the point of his shoulders, a successful mark out. One required move completed. His front end slammed down, and for the first time in my life, my feet went with him. His front end came up again, and my feet went back to the cantle of the bronc saddle. His front end went down again, and my feet were waiting on him. I was in perfect time. And the big horse bucked down the arena. I never felt like so much of a cowboy in my life. In perfect time with a good bronc. You just get in a rhythm. It's like dancing with a girl, Casey Tibbs. Best feeling in the world. Until my right foot made a completely independent decision to come out of the stirrup. And I had heard no whistle. And then I did hear it. The buzzer sounded. Good grief. I lost a pedal with one second to go. Goose egg. Do you know what a burden it is to be a superstar trapped in a mediocre body? My goodness, I thought to myself as I got off on the pickup man. I had it and let it slip away. Not that I could have beaten Butch, but if I had kept that stirrup for one more second, he would have been required to ride his third horse to win. If you ride three and no one else does, you win. With that, the best one there bent over the horse in the chute that he had drawn, and he opened the gate and turned him out. Not because he was afraid, but because there was no reason to risk injury. The horse loped calmly down the arena as Butch traded high fives with his Kansas teammates, celebrating his victory. I noticed the judges in the arena speaking up to the announcer above. The announcer covered his microphone with his hand like some judge in a courtroom, and he was looking down talking to them. And the judges were pointing to a small book they were holding, After a moment, the announcer nodded to them and, turning back to the microphone, said, Michael Johnson wins first in the Saddlebrock event. And the place erupted. Voices exploded. I had to do something in quickly. I assumed the Kansas team was storming the back entrance at this very moment and would, of course, kill everyone in their path. And I ran toward the judges. I had to explain to them there must be some mistake. But Butch had already beaten me to them. What in the world are you talking about? I heard him yell. And one of the judges calmly handed him an opened National Intercollegiate Rodeo Rules book and pointed at the page and said, Here, you read it. You tell me what you think it says. And Butch took the rule book and began to read. He scanned the page for a time. And then he raised his eyes to look over at me. He handed the rule book back to the judge and turned to me again. And slowly, he reached up and lifted his hat off his head an inch or two. And he gave me a small bow, and he turned and walked out of the arena. Oh, there's more to the story, and you'll hear it just a little later. Next, Baxter Black looks at a brand new unit of measurement that he calls a cow full, when the Spirit of the West continues right after this. Howdy, friends. This is Baxter Black on Spirit of the West with Hugh McLennan with a little peek at looking at a cow full. What holds the loaded 30,000-pound trailer to the heavy-duty truck? What holds the 38-foot RV trailer to the dually? What holds the two-horse trailer with your daughter's favorite pony to the half-ton pickup? Well, the odds are it's a B&W trailer hitch, probably a turnover bowl, American-made, employee-owned, customer-tuned, and proud of their part in America's greatness. B&W, holding things together down the road. Grandpa Tommy's dad used to say, a cow full is a substantial quantity. Well, according to my research, the rumen on a mature cow can hold up to 300 pounds, and by anybody's standards, that is quite a bit. Say you had a cow full of pocket change, you'd almost need a cow to keep it in. Say you had a cow full of wet laundry, 
it'd take a forklift to put it in the dryer. And say you had a cow full of cow manure. Well, I guess you guess a lot of us do. Well, if cow full became an accepted unit of measure, it could replace the antiquated English standards like the dram and the rod and those bland, simple-minded metric names that somehow sound communistic. Kiloliter. Desigram. Can you picture in mind a desigram? Is it the weight of a decimated graham cracker? Well, under the cowful system, 15 scoopfuls would equal a cowful. Two bootfuls would make a scoopful. Two hatfuls would make a bootful. And half a hatful would equal a capful. Six canfuls, as in beer cans, makes a capful. One canful equals 40 thimblefuls, 20 teardrops, and a thimbleful. Therefore, the dosage for penicillin would read... Four teardrops per five scoopfuls of body weight intermuscular. Bizarre, you say. If a cowful was a measure of weight or volume, possibly the distance between post holes would become the standard unit of measure for length, i.e. 660 post holes per section line, four thumbs to a hand, three hands to a foot, four feet to a coyote length, and two coyote lengths to a post hole. Decibels of loudness would be described in more understandable terms, like from chicken peck to pig squeal for everyday sounds. Loud noise would be categorized as small wreck, big wreck, or heck of a wreck. So, did you hear about Orban getting backed off? Must have sailed five coyote lengths, hit the side of the grain bin with a moose bugle, and two cowfuls of pellets fell on him. Smashed him flatter than a rabbit ear. They got him to the dock in half a coon's age, transfused him with a six-pack of typo negative, and removed a post hole of intestine. He's doing okay, but he's lost about six hatfuls. He's been a sheep's gestation recovering. Doc says it's shock, but I figured it just scared a pee wadden and a half out of him. Well, I gotta go. I got an appointment and four and a half shakes of a lamb's tail. This is Baxter Black on Spirit of the West with Hugh McLennan. Brought to you by B&W Turnover Bowl. How about a weekend pass to the 20th anniversary edition of the Kamloops Cowboy Festival, March 17th to 20th, 2016. What a lineup of entertainers. Tom Cole, Brian Salmond, Alan Mulberg, Gary Felgard, Ed Pikikoot, Tim Huss, the Western Spirit Band, and many of the performers from the very first festival 20 years ago. There's the BC Cowboy Hall of Fame inductions, the Spirit of the West Rising Star Showcase, dinner shows, evening concerts, and a wonderful art and gear show with the best artisans in the West. Workshops on everything from guitar picking to songwriting with the best experts in the field. For folks in Alberta, Frontier Bus Lines has a great package trip. You can get all the information at bccchs.com or call 1-888-763-2221. Mark your calendar for Ulrich Herford's 10th Annual Bull Sale, Tuesday, February 23rd at Baylock Auction, Lethbridge, Alberta. On offer, approximately 50 top quality bulls. The sale includes a great set of long yearlings, and you can see them at ulrichherfords.com. These bulls are the sons of industry leaders. For more information, call Peter, 403-625-1036. That number again, 1-403-625-1036. Ulrich Herford, specializing in light birth weights with great performance, plus remarkable cows. Now, just ahead of the Rangeland News, here's one from Kevin Davis. This good Oklahoma cowboy and singer has a new CD out called This Cowboy Life. They set up a catch pen on the north end of the pasture Gathered up the herd and pushed them all inside A young boy climbed up on the gate and looked over their capture And said, Dad, there ain't a head in here that I can't ride That's mighty big talk from such a little man Are you sure you think you got the stuff? He said, I'm 12 years old now I ain't scared of nothing You bet your bottom dollar That I'm darn sure tough enough So they tried to break him of the habit Long before the habit ever starts His daddy knows bull riding Ain't no way to make a living And he finds something else to do If he was smart Cause it'll get inside your soul And in your heart When they 
finished doing all the work they came to do The boy still had that look in his eyes His dad said, get your rope, son, we'll tie you on And let's see just how bad you want to ride They tied him on and turned him loose And he rode just like a champion He's still doing it today Cause that was ten years ago When that boy made a champion He's riding at the finals Top 15 BRCA But they tried to break him of the habit Long before the habit ever starts His daddy knows bull riding Ain't no way to make a living He'd find something else to do if he was smart Then get inside your soul and in your heart Cause it'll get inside your soul and in your heart of the rangeland, a roundup of news and coming events from around the west. We'll tell you what's new under the western sky right after this word from the Cattlemen of Western Canada. Beef cattle ranching is an important part of British Columbia's economy. Most ranches are family-owned, operated by second- or third-generation ranchers. Together, they employ over 4,000 people, supporting communities and local businesses such as veterinarians, mechanics, truckers, and more. Beef cattle ranching truly provides economic stability to many B.C. communities. On the Rangeland News, top of page one, the latest USDA cattle report could provide some clues on what direction the beef cattle industry will be heading this year. With more, here's Gary Crawford. We could have a little better idea of the current cattle herd and some clues on what 2016 will hold for the beef cattle industry when USDA releases its cattle report. USDA livestock analyst Shale Shagham told us first... It will give us an indication of the total number of animals in the U.S., total number of cattle in the U.S., total number of cows in the U.S. It will also give us an indication of the number of heifers which are being held for beef and dairy herd replacement with an additional piece of information about the number which would be expected to calf during 2016. Also, since we already have the number of animals in feedlots as of January 1st, then from this new report, Shagham says we'll be able to infer the number of cattle outside feedlots. So what you get is a total number of animals which would be likely of the age and sex distribution to be placed on feed during 2016. So the report could be one to move the market. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. At about 11.30 p.m. a week ago Wednesday, Michaela Robinson saw flames coming from her barn in Ladner, British Columbia. Sixteen horses were in the barn and she dropped everything and ran barefoot to lead the horses and ten barn cats out of the burning structure. Neighbors showed up within minutes to get the horses to safety, many of them with horse and stock trailers. And the horses are all okay, and the barn cats are being cared for at a community animal shelter. And uh, we wish her and her boarders the very best. We do know some of them. Well, for the information of producers around here, there will be a regular cattle sale on Tuesday, February the 16th at the BC Livestock Producers Co-op. As you might know, there was no sale on February the 2nd and February the 9th. The mayor of Gene Autry, Oklahoma, was arrested last Monday for speeding. Kyle Lawson was also charged with a misdemeanor because his driver's license was suspended. He agreed to pay the fine and resolve the matter. <laughs> I just can't help but wonder what Gene Autry would have said. Oh, back to the B.C. Livestock Producers Co-op. Uh, the Bar M Ranch traced a boar's complete cowherd dispersal sale. Dispersal sale was just a couple of weeks ago. His uh, young second calf heifers traded to $2,520 a head, and their powerful bred heifers also reached $2,500. The mature bred cows traded to $2,425. I've known Trace for a long time and always enjoyed being invited to bring my horse, my rope, and my guitar to his brandings. And there we'd heal calves all day, drag them to that wood fire, no tiger torches allowed, and then we'd sing old songs of the West for the crew when the job was done. As of January the 1st, changes to the Canadian Code of Practice for the Care and Handling of Beef Cattle will require beef producers to provide pain control during procedures such as castration and dehorning. The code says, 
We must now use pain control in consultation with a veterinarian when we're dehorning and castrating animals older than nine months. And in January 2018, the requirement will be for all cattle castrated older than six months. Oh boy, got the latest issue of Alberta Beef Magazine sitting on my desk and uh, the latest issue of uh, Beef Illustrated on our kitchen table. Love going through those. Lots of great information. I'd suggest you subscribe to both of them no matter where you are if you want to stay on top of the cattle industry. Saturday, February 20th at the Innisfail Auction Market, there's a big sale for P&H ranching and guests, some good bulls and some real good ranch horses, and you can get more details at InnisfailAuctionMarket.com. And that takes us down to the final item. You know, a lot of our Spirit of the West cruisers have had great experiences shopping in Mexican ports and Caribbean ports, and it reminds me of a few years ago when my guitar-playing little brother Jim and his wife Linda were with us, and they found a place in the Caribbean that was actually manufacturing bars, custom bars of soap. So Jim ordered one, and the guy said, Okay now, do you want it scented? And Jim says, uh, Oh, no thanks, I'll just take it home with me. <laughs> and that's the Rangeland News. Coming up on the horse training file, a listener has a good horse in most ways, but when... The horse hasn't been used for a while, it gets pretty spooky on those first few rides. I'll tell you what I would probably do on those first rides, and the conclusion of Dr. Michael Johnson's story, when the Spirit of the West continues right after this. Welcome back to the Spirit of the West. Coming up on the horse training file, I have a couple of suggestions for making those first few rides of the season a little easier for the horse and the rider, especially if the horse has been off all winter. And Dr. Michael Johnson explains how he actually managed to win that high school saddle bronc championship right after a word about our next cruise. It will hopefully fit that little window between seeding and spring turnout and haying in mid-June 2017. It will be, you guessed it, way up north to Alaska, way up north. Yeah, the rush is already on. <laughs> the Spirit of the West gang will fly. We have over 40 people booked already on this one. And the Spirit of the West gang will fly to Anchorage on or around early June 2017. We'll have about three days of touring that includes the spectacular Denali National Park Railroad with wildlife roaming free, a look at the highest peak in North America, Mount McKinley, great meals, a fine hotel, and then we board a beautiful cruise ship for a journey down the Inside Passage with side trips to some of Alaska's most famous spots, sailing right into the amazing Vancouver waterfront. And uh, as I said, we already have a bunch of folks signed up for this one. Get all the details on our cruise page at u mclennancom or call the toll-free number 1-800-530-0131. Now, this week's horse training file. I have a pretty good horse, but he scares me sometimes. That's from an experienced rider that uh, doesn't really consider himself a trainer. The problem with this horse, he says, is if I don't ride him for a few weeks, he starts out okay, but once I get on and head out, usually shortly into the ride, something will scare him and he'll really spook. He's quick and has dumped me off a time or two when he spun around or jumped sideways. Now, spring is coming, and I'm almost afraid to ride him very far because he's been left alone except for uh, being fed all winter. Okay, well, here's what I'd probably do with a horse like that. I'd make a point to work with him every day, if possible, uh, even if it's only for an hour or less. My whole objective would be to make the session so comfortable for him that he looks forward to it. You can start by having him saddled and working him on a 12-foot line and have him circle around you at a walk and then at a trot in both directions and then work on helping him find the active sweet spot. He'll show you with his eyes, his head, and his tail when he's really into it. After a session or two, I'd get on and just keep in a very familiar area, probably where you did the groundwork. After making sure he's good to go, I'd ride him on that same circle I worked him on from the ground. Walk a couple dozen, then trot a few circles in both directions, and 
Then I'd ride him around the area, the arena, the yard, the driveway, usually at a walk, and then I'd let him rest at a standstill quite frequently, and then I'd call it good, unsaddle him and give him a nice brushing and turn him up. In a day or two, he probably won't need the groundwork, so I'd just get on and start riding him on that circle, and then again ride around those familiar places, asking him to trot a little, maybe up the driveway or around the arena. And he should begin to get so comfortable being ridden this way that it, uh, it may take a week or two, but he should be able to keep this comfort when you go a little further for a little longer. Now there still might be a time when something will startle him and he still might jump or spin, but he should be able to handle it easier and he should calm down a lot quicker. And if you're heading out somewhere and he stops out of concern for a scary object he might be a little afraid of, let him stop. Maybe gently back him a few steps. Keep calm and, if possible, keep him facing the direction you want to go. And then just be patient and wait for him to decide that it's okay. And he'll probably calmly walk past it, thanking you for the reassurance. And that's the horse training file. Something else our horses really appreciate is that daily feeding of Hoffman's Horse Ration. And you can find out more at hoffmanshorseration.com. I hear these horses are headed to the Top Gun Horse Sale. Consign now to the third annual Top Gun Horse Sale and be part of the largest selection of rogue horses offered for sale in Western Canada. Preview April 16th at 5 p.m. Sale starts April 17th at high noon. Ride, rope, ranch, trail riding, barrel racing, team sorting, kids' horses, broke teams, young stock, and many more. All horses will be ridden, driven, or led into the sale ring. Heated box stalls, wash racks, heated indoor arena, hay shavings, cattle to preview at no extra cost. Rain or shine, everything's inside. Book now to receive the most advertising. For more information and entry forms, go to TopGunHorseSales.com or call Jordan at 403-783-0246. Now, just before we take you back to Dr. Michael Johnson's story, here's a gal that's developing into a Western music superstar. And you may remember seeing her at the Kamloops Cowboy Festival a few years back when she was the winner of the Rising Star competition. With the horse nobody could ride, here's Kristen Harris. She was a wild young Mustang, no bridle, no reins, full of fire and spirit inside. The last of her rare breed, born to run free, the horse that nobody could ride. A hundred young tried to break her their stories were told far and wide sure as the wind blows each cowboy got thrown by the horse that nobody could ride then down out of Cheyenne came a quiet and shy man today to try Okay, now 
let's get back to Dr. Michael Johnson. And after Michael had lost a stirrup on his third bronc ride of the finals, even though he made the buzzer, he thought he had no chance of getting first place. Until the judges explained something in the rule book. To be eligible for the average, contestants must mount out all heads of stock. But how does that cause me to win, I asked looking up. You were the only contestant to do that, son, said the judge. All the other competitors turned their last horse out, too, because they had no chance to win. When Butch turned his last one out, because he thought he had won, you became the only person to mount out all heads of stock. You were the only person to get on three broncs. Even though Butch had the lead, when he failed to get on his last one, he disqualified himself. You win. Simple as that. Later, I saw Butch behind the arena with the Kansas team. Even though it was somewhat like Custer entering an Indian village, I walked into the middle of their circle. They had built a small fire. I couldn't see any face, clearly just shadows. Might not be the best place for you right now, Texas, came a voice from the darkness to my left, especially if you came to gloat. No, I said, I'm looking for Butch. I'm here, said the shadows to my right. I'm here to offer you the prize money, I said. We both know who won. I'd like to keep the buckle if you don't mind, but you can have that too if you want it, I added, hoping he didn't. No, he said, that's nice of you, but I learned something here tonight. And that is, no matter how far ahead you might be in a race, you have to finish to win. And without thinking, I said, yeah and no matter how far behind either, and everyone laughed. My offer still stands, I said. No, he said, you keep the money in the buckle. I'll win plenty more. You know, I think I will keep it, I said, cause I won't win plenty more. And Butch rose from the darkness and walked into the light and extended his hand and said, well done, Texas. And I took his hand and I said, yeah, right. And everybody laughed again. It just goes to show you, I guess, you don't have to be the best one there to win. 80% of life is just showing up. Woody Allen. So there you have one, just one of the terrific stories from Michael's brand new book, The Trials of Joe Ben Black, Confessions of a Rope Horse. And there's so much more to come. You can order the book or the printed of the audiobook or the printed version, by the way, at his website, michaeljohnsonbooks.com. Next, it's a look at another classic song of the West, the story behind the song, and then some fine cowboy poetry when the spirit of the West continues right after this. Welcome back to the spirit of the West. Here's an old Arabian proverb, the best speaker is he who turns ears into eyes. Now, Dr. Michael Johnson could certainly do that, and uh, you know who else could? Marty Robbins. He wrote hundreds of songs, and my favorites were his real songs of the West, and this one is really descriptive. As long as cowboys have ridden and horses have bucked them off, there have been legends of the horse that could never be rode and the cowboy who could never be thrown. Curly Fletcher's epic Strawberry Roan is, of course, one of the notable ones. This one, written by Marty Robbins, takes place in the rodeo arena, where the cowboy who could ride anything draws the bronc that nobody could ride. And this is a fine version of the story of Old Red from Abe Zacharias. <laughs> One of the orneriest, yeah, I'd seen at the big rodeo. He'd bite you and kick you and stomp out your line. All red had never been thrown. Meaner than sin, wild as a wind that blew on the Montana plain. All red was one of the last of his breed, but he was about to be tamed. From Idaho, a young cowboy came to ride in the big rodeo. Young cowboy's name was Billy McLean, and Billy had never been thrown. 
greatest desire of young Billy's heart was to ride this old outlaw called Red. He drew him one day and I heard Billy say, I'll ride him or drop over dead. Old Red was wicked down there in the chute, he was kicking and stomping about. Billy climbed into the saddle with ease, then yelled, turn him loose, let us out. Old Red came out with his head on the ground, his back feet were touching his nose. Trying to get rid of the man on his back, but the man went wherever he goes. Billy was raking Old Red with his spurs, from his head to the tip of his skin. He was doing right well, but Billy could tell This outlaw would never give in Old Red was heading straight for the fence Suddenly stopping just then He reared on his hind leg and fell on his back Taking poor Billy with him There was a hush in the crowd and they knew this would be Billy's last ride The saddle horn crushed Billy's chest when they fell And under Old Red Billy died Old Red lay still, no more would he move The cowboys who'd seen it could tell In trying to throw Billy off of his back Old Red broke his neck when he fell Out in the west is a place where they rest This cowboy who'd never been thrown And one foot away resting there in the clay Is the outlaw who never was thrown Robert Bean was born and raised in Oklahoma. He started riding bulls and rodeos when he was about 16 years old, and then he, he rode bulls for the next 17 years. He worked on a lot of ranches in Oklahoma and Nebraska before he started a full-time career as a farrier, and that's an occupation he continues today. He's in the Cowboy Poetry Spotlight this week with Birth of a Buckaroo. I was sitting alone one evening after dark when outside the window my dog starts to bark. Well, I jumped from my chair and looked through the pane to see who'd be coming this late up the lane. I knowed who it was when I saw the old truck. It was a young fella from town, I think they call Buck. Well, he walked to the door, and I let him right in. Just come to see you, he says with a grin. Well, his work was done, and he'd run out of luck, with nowhere to stay except his old truck. He'd never worked cattle, but be willing to learn, and be a good hand if just given a turn. Wouldn't ask for much, and... Didn't need pay. His main concern was a dry place to stay. What was spring coming on and the rains we'd have here? I figured some help would be nice to have near. Well, he asked about the work and I told him get ready. For hard work round cows, it stays pretty steady. Now, round cows, he was green, this young city feller. But I'll tell you for sure, old Buck, he weren't yeller. We fed through the morning and he did his share. And I tell you by noon, we're hungry as bears. The evening went fine, we're working horseback. I could tell before long this kid had a knack. And he'd never wrote before, so I showed him how, and it didn't take long to catch his first cow. Well, the summer went fast, as most of them do, but the truth was fall was way overdue. A bucky learned fast and saved most of his pay to buy his own cack and go his own way. Winter was coming and work would slow down but I talked to the boss about keeping him around. Then winter hit hard. It got colder than hell. Winds blew from the north and the temperature fell. We fed every morning and chopped ice too, and then we'd stop and warm up with a hot cup of brew. Old Buck never whimpered, no, he never whined, like some city fellers I've known in my time. He stuck it out till the winter was through, and I'm telling you, boys, he'd become a buckaroo. He's still working horseback, I see him now and again. He made a good hand and a heck of a friend. And it just goes to show you that cowboying's an art, but you don't have to be born one for it to be in your heart. Well, thank you so much for making the ride this week, and I sure hope you can ride along next week at the same time. 
Oh yeah, and Mark McMillan, our, of our support crew and also chairman of the Kamloops Cowboy Festival, wanted me to let you know that the Frontier Bus Lines bus bringing folks from Alberta to the Cowboy Festival has been sold out. But Anderson Vacations is putting a trip together and they still have some room on their bus. You can contact them at 1-866-814-7378. And we just got the new issue of Canadian Cowboy Country Magazine in our mail this week, and I sure enjoyed reading through it. It has part two of my story of Black Beauty, the most challenging horse I think I ever worked with. You can subscribe online at cowboycountrymagazine.com. Till next week, I'm Hugh McLennan. Hope to see you down the trail somewhere real soon. <laughs>